All right, back on the Young Turks. I mean, welcome to the Young Turks. I'm your host, Jake Uger. JR is producing. Jesus is directing. Jam-packed show for you today. Uh, we got a lot of great interviews, including Richard Stengel, uh, who's the editor of Time Magazine, and he's written a book about Nelson Mandela, the living legend Mandela. But is Mandela a terrorist? Uh oh, that's the right wing charges. We'll talk to him about that uh, a little bit later in the program. And then uh, two stories that I absolutely love in today's show. One is about um, the guy who helped fin write financial reform. You'll never believe where he went. Uh, that's a great, great story, very indicative of uh, how uh, our current system works. And then uh, the people who c created this doubt about climate change, how they did it, who they are, and other fantastic stories. That's coming up a little bit later in the program. And then I got great clips for you guys, et cetera. But I want to start with um, something unusual on the program. Normally, I tell you all the things I'm right about, right? <laughs> and I, I don't like to do it, but uh, go ahead, you tell me what I told you, right? How many times have you heard that on the show? Now, uh, let me tell you the things I was wrong about today. Uh-oh. Well, you know, wrong's an interesting question, but, um, well, okay, let me tell you, and then we'll decide together. For, so first, uh, you know, when Eric Cantor said, oh, I got all these threats, and, um, and my office was shot at, that, that story didn't ring true to me, and I said, my ass, and it turned out that I was right about uh, the, his office being shot at, because it wasn't, and the uh, police concluded that it was a random shot, that it was not directed at the office, that it had gone up and coincidentally fallen in his office. It's not me saying that's the police. So I was right about that. But you know what? It turns out uh, that Cantor does have some psychotic guy who's out to get him. Uh, and this guy makes, uh, made YouTube videos, made very threatening videos about Eric Cantor. Now, I saw some of the videos. He was also threatening about... Barack Obama and the Democrats, et cetera, et cetera. The guy's touched, right? His name is Norman Laboon. Um, but you know what? He definitely said things about Eric Cantor, and he is now, you know, uh, being investigated about that, as he should be. So I'm surprised by that. But you know what? I shouldn't be, because are there unstable people on all sides? Of course there are. And this guy's not any, on any side. He hates the Democrats. He hates the Republicans, et cetera. But uh, there, apparently there were very legitimate threats against Eric Cantor. So that's... I'm going to call that my bet, okay? Um, and, uh, so, and you know what? I'll keep that, uh, an open mind about that later because, like I said, you never know. You never know. There's crazy people all across the country. So, and obviously, any threats against any politician, Democrat or Republican, should be taken very, very seriously. And I'm glad that they're doing that about Norman Lubu. Second kind of correction is, you know, yesterday uh, we did the Michael Steele story. And, you know, I... He had the two, nearly $2,000 that they spent on Voyeur, which is the bondage-themed, you know, topless lesbian club, et cetera, in West Hollywood here. And they swore up and down that uh, Michael Steele was not the one at the club. And, you know, as I did the story, I did a little wink and nod, like, oh, I'm sure it wasn't him. <laughs> right? Um, but you know what? It looks like, from based on the facts, that it wasn't him. And, and it was the, the young Republicans who were the donors who had gone to that. I mean, that's funny in and of itself. And Michael Steele says, oh, I didn't know anybody went. We shouldn't have authorized that. But then, you know, he is the leader, and he should obviously watch out for that. But having said that, it wasn't him. So I withdraw my wink. <laughs> okay, so, okay. And furthermore, I was like, how the hell do you spend $1,900 at a, at a club like that? I couldn't possibly drink that much alcohol. Well, they had gone as a group. So that makes a lot more sense, too. Okay? Now, people are still talking about that hypocrisy, and there is definitely hypocrisy of the family values, you know, party going to voyeur club and watching the, the topless lesbians. But nonetheless, it wasn't Michael Steele, it appears. And, and it wasn't just one person spending the money. I want to get things right on the show, and that's why it's important. That's why, look, a lot of times the corrections are buried in, in newspapers or anywhere else. Oh, by the way, there's a correction. And they move on. I'm doing it from the top of the show, okay? Because we've got to get things right here. And then finally, this one is not really as much of a correction. Um, it's um, it, the, you know, yesterday we told you a story about the insurers saying, huh, you know what? Uh, the way we read the bill, uh, children um, with pre existing conditions still can be denied. And by the way, we're also going to raise your rates. Um, then what happened after the show was Kathleen Sebelius came out, or after we started doing the show, this news started breaking. Kathleen Sebelius came out and said, no, I'm not going to let the insurers get away with this. 
and and she said, no, we're not going to let you do any loophole. It's over. You lost. Stop looking for loopholes, etc. And that's the usual braggadocio of, of the Obama administration that I always find kind of annoying. I'm like, what are you going to do about it? They're going to go to court. I mean, what are you going to stop them? You can't stop them. But it turns out, hey, you know what? Even though I didn't say that on air, I was wrong about that attitude because it turns out they did stop them. The insurers took too much heat, they thought, and they said, okay, Sibelius, you win, Obama, you win. We won't press that in court, even though we think we're right on the language of the bill. And, you know, there was something interesting about that because the way that they framed it, it seemed like they already knew that language was in there, was placed in there, and that they were waiting for the bill to get passed and say, ha ha, we don't have to do it. So I don't know if somebody that wound up being a lobbyist for them put that into the bill or wrote it that way, but it didn't matter. At the end, Obama leaning on them and Sebelius leaning on them worked, okay? And I often say that that usually won't work, but it did in this case, so credit where credit is due. Now, I wasn't technically wrong about anything, but, you know, but they did a good job with that in a way that I wouldn't have expected. Now, can the, the second half of that argument, does it still hold? Can the insurer still... Uh, raise your premiums and there's nothing the Obama administration can do about it? Absolutely. And so that, that has not changed at all. And as I've said to you all from the beginning, that's the main problem. Okay? So we're still at the mercy of the insurance companies in a lot of ways, and they will still re raise your rates. But you know what? Definitely score one for the Obama team in handling that one right, at least the, the first half of it. All right. Fair is fair. Now, let's have a little bit of fun. Uh, I'm going to go to O'Reilly and I'm going to go to C-SPAN. But since I said fun, let's start with C-SPAN because we have a caller who apparently is a little fed up with how many black people get on C-SPAN. I didn't realize that, that was a big problem, but, you know, maybe I'm not watching C-SPAN enough. So let's let the caller explain. Clip number seven. Let's hear from St. Paul's, North Carolina. Bill's a Republican caller. Yeah, I'd like to make a little respectful criticism here uh, about C-SPAN. Uh, the last two guys I know were white guys. But you have black folks calling in on the Republican line, independents, and you have so many of them, I can't believe this is just an accident. Uh, if you keep on with the way you've been programming, you should change your name from C-SPAN to Blackspan. I mean, I know they have an opinion, but I wish that they would be honest and call in on the right line. Every one of them thinks that Obama is Jesus Christ, and they don't like when anybody criticizes him. Well, I, I didn't hear all this uh, uh, anger when George Bush was in. I mean, all they did was criticize George Bush. Every day you'd hear, He's, he lied, he lied, all this stuff. And I don't know how so many of these folks, if they're 10% or 12% of the population, seems to be 80% of your callers. Now, I don't know what you can do about it, but I'm just about ready, and I, did, I think a lot of other Republicans and conservatives are just about ready just to go somewhere else. Uh, there are so many fun things about that. One, how uncomfortable the anchor is. He's like... <laughs> but you know what? Give C-SPAN a lot of credit. They're there to, you know, air the unedited views of the American people. And that guy's an American, and that's his views. Now, and it's better to hear it than not hear it, if you ask me, because then I know where he's coming from. And, look, it's one thing for him to say, you know, liberals or maybe even black liberals, but he said all black guys... I know they have an opinion. Are you not merciful? <laughs> when he's complaining, they're calling on the wrong line. Then that would be a legitimate complaint if you didn't way overgeneralize. Uh, and then, and, and at one point, he said, "Look, every one of them thinks that Obama is Jesus Christ." Well, we had two on the show yesterday who did not believe that. <laughs> right? So again, you might want to check your generalizations. And then, who didn't love that nickname, Blackspan? <laughs> All right, J.I. Well, it's, it's an indication of how the thought process is. Yeah, you know what? Guess what? When, when President Bush was in office, we were saying, not we, people were saying, thank God for President W. Thank God for God's sin. God's sin. I was like, really? I said, he's screwing things up. 
But I wasn't saying, see, just because you white people, just because he's a white president, you think thank God for him. You think he's godlike. No, I just think you support him, so you think he can do no wrong, and you're, re- you're stupid for it. And then the problem is when it's the other way around, it's these black people only support this guy because he's black. They don't think for themselves. They have no brain. They see black and white when really they just see black and white. No, no, it's another great point by JR because it's, it comes back to your theme of projection, JR. Because remember those quotes that we had when Bush was president? It, there was this great quote from a woman in 2004 in the middle of the election where she said, Look, I, the reporter was like, Well, what do you think about this or what do you think about that? She's like, I don't care about any of those facts. God chose George Bush, so I'm going to vote for George Bush. Now, of course, that just drives you crazy because how do you know God picked George Bush? He told you, right? It doesn't make any sense. But, you know, the cons- for some conservatives, certainly not all, but for some conservatives who are Christian right, et cetera, who are like, look, who, who did God pick? Uh, they asked their leaders, who did God pick? Oh, Bush, they picked Bush. Or, well, that I'm on Bush's side, damn the facts, right? Now, so they assume that you think likewise. But I don't actually know any liberal or anyone who thinks that God sent Barack Obama. Like, you know how they, you know, the Rush Limbaugh's, et cetera, keep working that, oh, they think he's the Messiah. But no one actually believes that. I don't know a single liberal who thinks, oh, Barack Obama. I mean, I'm not going to question anything he said because God sent him. Never heard that, okay? It doesn't exist. It's the projection of conservatives because that's how they think about their leaders. So, you know, and JR, when I first saw the clip, I hadn't seen it that way. But you're exactly right about that. So... There you have it. Okay, the, the conservative mind. We try to delve into those dangerous waters from time to time. <laughs> but there, there it is in this case. Now, speaking of the conservative mind, let's go to O'Reilly. O'Reilly did what is a hilarious um, interview with Newsmax. I mean, the biggest softball interview you have ever seen in your life. Okay. Now, I, I think there were parts of this interview that I liked from O'Reilly, to be honest with you. And I'm telling you, I respect that guy in a lot of ways. But let's start with the first setup. They're introducing him. Okay, there's two anchors who I'm going to comment on in a second. Okay, and one of them is like, oh, the greatest, and then the other one asks the first question. So let's watch. Clip number one. During the late 70s and 80s, he was a news reporter for various local TV stations and eventually CBS and ABC networks. And in the early 90s, he hosted the entertainment news program Inside Edition. He's won many journalism awards and three Emmys. So Bill O'Reilly has a very impressive background in broadcast journalism as well. He's been with Fox for 14 years now and counting. Welcome to Newsmax, Bill. Okay, guys, thank you. Nice to see you here, Bill. The O'Reilly Factor kicks off Fox's primetime lineup and is considered Fox's most valuable advertising vehicle. You're on track this year to record your best ratings ever. You've been at the top of cable news ratings for more than a decade. What is it like to be king of the hill and for so long? Oh, come on. I just don't think about that. You know, the ratings are very good. We have two runs at 8 and 11 Eastern, Eastern time. Combination of about five and a half million every night, um, and but that's a fraction of who sees us because it goes out on the internet. You know, Newsmax and everybody else. Every time I do something crazy, they put it on the on the website. So, just gazillions of people all over the world see the program. But if I thought about that, I I, I would lose perspective. So I just go to work every day. Go oh, go 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 go! I love that. So go oh, five and a half million if you combine the two programs, and then gazillions because I've I've been tracking it all day, etc. Uh, but I don't really think about that. <laughs> Come on, Bill. But who cares? Who cares? Let's concentrate on the actors uh, or the anchors. That dude's straight out of Laurel and Hardy, man. I mean, that guy's old school. First of all, <laughs> you need to regulate that mustache, man. What's up with that? I mean, that's some old school clown ass shit, right? With that mustache? What was up? And then his anchoring is awesome. He's like, and Bill O'Reilly was a news anchor earlier, and he has won many journalism awards. Really, by the way? I- I could be wrong. Journalism awards for Bill O'Reilly? Maybe, maybe. And then his co-anchor, I mean, she's another cartoon character. I mean, she looks like a cartoon character. And then she's like, Mr. O'Reilly, you are the greatest anchor of all time. You're number one, and you beat everybody. How does it feel to be king of the hill? <laughs> uh, O'Reilly's like, hey, now that we're having fun, man, now, I mean, you, uh, grab a loofah. Let's go to work, right? <laughs> And then uh, on O'Reilly, is it me, or does he look 20 years older in that interview? Man, the magic of television. Dude, don't do that again. And I'm trying to look out for you, O'Reilly. Go in a tie and stuff. 
when you go with the V-neck thing from, you know, Boca Raton or whatever, and you're trying to hang out, eh, not a good look for you. You look like 88 over there. But, yeah. It was the first thing I saw. I, I was like, man, it, it, they look like brown scrubs. Yeah. And then I was like, well, wait a second. I, and when you see the, you know, the lack of polished gankers there, I was like, well, maybe this is like a, a favor. And yeah. he's chilling, and they're like, hey, can you come and finally do it? And he's like, oh, fine. He just grabs a shirt with his eyes closed. and like, yeah. Okay, what do you guys want to ask me? <laughs> he's sitting there the whole time like, really? He doesn't even like that they're kissing his ass. No, he doesn't. That's, that, I'm telling you, man. There's things to like about O'Reilly. I know, I know. But he's, he, he likes it, too. I mean, he likes getting blown. So he's like, oh, yeah, I'm number one. What can I do? I don't really think about it. But then, it, like, he got bored halfway through the interview. It was like a 15-minute interview, and he's like, okay, okay. And so now let's go to clip number two. Uh, why CNN and MSNBC suck? So this is funny. Let's watch. Bill, CNN and MSNBC combined have far fewer viewers than Fox. What is it about those networks where they're not getting it, and why do you think nobody's watching them? Why aren't they gaining traction with Americans? It's an interesting question because CNN, easy, of course, yeah. was the top of the hill. Uh, and when we came in uh, 13 and a half years ago, nobody, and Ted Turner goes, well, squash them like a bug and all of that. So what happened to CNN? Basically, they stayed where they were 10 years ago. They did not change with the times. We live in a very intense country right now, very difficult time. CNN does not reflect that urgency. They basically report the news, and they do a good job. If you watch their Haiti coverage, it was excellent. But people in the United States now, they know the news already because they have the internet, they have talk radio, they have you know, a lot of vehicles. So when they, they, want, they want analysis and perspective from a cable network, particularly in prime time, because they already heard it. They don't want to hear it again. CNN doesn't give you that. So that's why they have fallen off dramatically. Programs like Larry King are a shadow of what they used to be. MSNBC made the, the key mistake of hiring bad people. It's as simple as that. They got a bunch of gutter snipes yeah. on their network that even if you're a liberal, which is what they sell, you go, you know, I don't like these people. Fox, we, I mean, Beck is a nice guy. Ah. Greta is a nice person. Shepard is a good personality. I don't know how I fit into all this, but um, Hannity is a Republican. He identifies himself that way. So that it's, it's real people. And then you turn on MSNBC and you see these people, they're attacking personally, they're throwing all kinds of stuff around, tea baggers, you know, and people go, you know, it's unpleasant. I'm not going to watch it. And they don't. It, see, that's O'Reilly in a nutshell, because half of what he says makes sense. When he talks about CNN and cable, he's 100% right. They stayed exactly where they were, and people already get the news from online. They don't go to CNN anymore, and so they need to adjust, and they never did, and that's why they're tanking. He's right about that. Then he goes to MSNBC, and he drives you crazy. Gutter snipers? Rachel Maddow? <laughs> okay, you can say a lot of things about Rachel, but she ain't in the gutter. Okay, she's about as classy as it gets, uh, not only on cable news, but on all of television. He can't really believe that. He just doesn't like them. And so he breaks it down in some ridiculous, simplistic way of, you know what? They hired bad people. <laughs> it's as simple as that. No, it's, that's ridiculous. And their ratings are going up. So what does that mean? And then uh, when he gets to the Fox analysis, that's when it just gets comical. I mean, look, we're all good guys at Fox, like Beck and Hannity and Greta, and him. <laughs> no, come on, but it, that's the one you go, look, I think he's being disingenuous. He can't possibly think that Hannity and Glenn Beck don't attack people personally. Bill Ayers, uh, Reverend Wright, communist, Nazi, socialist, fascist, etc. That they're not gutter snipers and they don't attack people, let alone O'Reilly, let alone himself. But that MSNBC is not classy and they hired bad people? You, you, no one can possibly believe that. I mean, you could disagree with them, and you could say, oh, Oberman's too much or something, right? But you can't say they're all gutter snipers and, and that Fox is full of Barney and, and friendly people that the folks appreciate. That's crazy talk. So that's, that's the maddening dichotomy of Bill O'Reilly right there. All right, one more for you. Um, let's go to clip number three where he actually talks about Obama and health care and the nanny state, et cetera. Bill, your show has devoted a lot of attention to the issue of Obamacare, and now the curtain has come down. Do you think it's pretty clear that President Obama is trying to move this nation in a socialist direction? 
<laughs> socialist is a loaded word, and I, and I don't like to use it because it's too simplistic. And if people really want to understand President Obama, and they should, you've got to go in and you've got to really put yourself in his position. All right, you've got to put yourself in Barack Obama's shoes. All right, now who is Barack Obama? Barack Obama is a very sincere individual. Number one, he's he believes in what he's doing. Number one, he's not a phony, like many politicians are. Number two, he is a far left guy. He believes that the government is there to impose. That's a very important word. Social justice, not to persuade, not to say, to impose. To make laws that say, we're going to take money from the wealthy and we're going to give it to those who don't have a lot of money. We're going to make laws that do that. So he has taken a Western European model, France, Sweden, the Netherlands, and he says, I like that. The nanny state, cradle to grave entitlements. Everybody gets something so nobody is destitute. I'm Barack Obama. I like that. And I'm going to bring that here to the United States which traditionally has not had it. So therefore, you have the progressives, which he is, boom, up against the traditionalists that say, we don't want that. That saps our strength. We want to compete. And when you compete, some people win and some people lose. See, that's why I like O'Reilly so much better than others. I mean, if you're wondering, OK? Because uh, first of all, he's 10 times smarter than the other conservative hosts, easily. And if you watch the whole 15-minute interview, a lot of parts where you go, okay, that's fair enough from his perspective. And second of all, you saw what he did there. And he said, look, the guy's sincere and he's not a bad guy and claiming it, the personal attacks are ridiculous, right? And then that synopsis is pretty fair, okay? Now, it's, do I agree with it? No, no, no. I'm, Obama's not trying to turn the country into Sweden. Now, of course, I don't believe in the nanny state, all that stuff. But he's saying, look, the progressives are not some weird, you know, communist, now Nazi Maoist like Beck is, and blowing things out of proportion and, and just simply just lying about it, as Beck does. And so he says, look, they want more government to take care of people, to give, provide a little bit more security. And the right wing say, no, let's compete. And if you, you know, you're on your own. That's a fairly accurate description. I mean, it's a little too, obviously, way too simple, et cetera, et cetera. But I can live with that. That's a fair debate. And that's the debate we should have all the time. And, and I think that people get that O'Reilly's smarter, and I think that's why he has the best ratings. Uh, and he's a, more of a showman. And you see that when you juxtapose him to those clown Newsmax anchors, right? I mean, there's Laurel and Hardy and the, you know, and Barbie and whatever, and, and they're like, okay, Mr. O'Reilly. And you're like, man, that's, that sucks. And then you, you see O'Reilly, and you're like, okay, the guy's, he knows how to do this thing. Have I given too much credit to O'Reilly? I probably have. Okay, but I think there's, there's something in Papa Bear. <laughs> there's something in him. And I can respect him a hell of a lot more than the Becks of the world. All right, enough of that. Let's come back, have an intelligent conversation with Matt Ho, who is a former diplomat in Afghanistan, about whether we've got the exact wrong strategy there. Young Turks. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Young Turks. Exciting hour ahead for you guys. I'm your host, Cenk Uger. J.R. Jackson's producing and Jesus is directing. And uh, I, I have two, I think, of the most relevant stories, certainly of today, this week, etc. I think they show you exactly what's going on in politics. We're going to do that uh, as the very next two stories, after I do uh, the Carl Rove story. Because Carl Rove was out here in L.A., just a couple blocks from here, and he was doing a speech, and some um, uh, protesters uh, wound up heckling him. And um, where you draw the line here, I think, is very, very important. So what I want to do is show you the video, and of course you listen to it and, and uh, on the radio and if you're podcasting, uh, and uh, and then come back and analyze what went wrong, what I think the protesters should have done, and what they shouldn't have done. So let's look at clip number eight. No, 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 I didn't say go ahead. I would say you get away. 
Former White House senior advisor and deputy chief of staff Karl Rove was shouted down and forced to leave by a small group of anti-war protesters at a book signing event in Beverly Hills. The co-founder of the anti-war group Code Pink tried to make a citizen's arrest of Rove and advanced toward him with a pair of handcuffs. Look what you did. You, you outed a CIA officer. You lied to take us to war. You ruined the country. Totally ruined the country. As Code Pink co-founder Jody Evans was pushed away, another protester confronted Rove, charging he's a war criminal. Here's the deal. The comfort I take is that you're going to rot in hell. Oh, with no visible security around, Rove was left to fend for himself and engaged the protesters in some heated exchanges. With all due respect, this goes to show the totalitarianism of the left. They don't believe in they don't believe in dialogue. They don't believe in courtesy. They don't believe in First Amendment rights for anybody but themselves. The signs of conflict came early in the program when another anti-war member of the audience accused Rove of participating in a campaign to purposely lie to and mislead the American people about Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction. A campaign the audience member charged that led America into the Iraq War. You know what? If you want to keep interrupting me, you can get the heck out of here. Yeah. You can get the heck out of here. All right, here, 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 here. Look, look, look. Have respect. Have respect for these people. Like the tap your. No, sir, 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 sir. The Downey Street memos are a complete fabrication. This man is a lunatic. You can leave, sir. When tempers briefly cooled, Rove told the crowd of about 100 people the charge right, here, that here, the administration here, lied was absolute so nonsense and politically the motivated. It's a pernicious political attack launched by cynical and hypocritical individuals. After the event ended in chaos and audience members were left to wander away with their books unsigned, Several members of the audience said they were distraught about how it broke up. All right, now look, what, I, what do I think makes sense and what doesn't? Do I want to discourage Code Pink from protests and Karl Rove, etc.? Of course not. Uh, but I think there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. If you come in initially with your signs and you do, you know, shout whatever you're going to shout, I, I wouldn't go in that direction necessarily of shouting, but if you want to do that, okay. But you've got to limit it to a certain period of time and then you've got to let the man speak okay because it's America he and those people came to hear him speak now you might think he's a war criminal I might think you know that he did a lot of things wrong broke the law etc cetera, etc cetera. but he's never been convicted of that and it, if we do that based on what we believe and not what courts decided etc then we're never gonna have any dialogue in this country because believe me the people on the other side are just as adamant and they're just as passionate and they think that the our side is criminals etc cetera, etc cetera. so and in the beginning of the video for those of you who saw it there's a little bit of touching of rope no 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 touching no pushing that's way out of bounds if you want to do, bring the handcuffs to do a citizen's arrest that's fine that's you know that's theatrics and I got no problems with theatrics you have first amendment rights as well but you have to do it in a controlled way. If you want to ask him really tough questions afterwards, great, I love that, absolutely. And both sides should get the tough questions, no matter what. But if you don't let the man speak, then we can't have an, imp the dialogue that we need to have. And it doesn't matter. And always in these situations, think about, what if the shoe was on the other foot, right? What if it's someone you like who's speaking up there, Howard Dean, yourself, whoever it might be, and the right-wing guys won't let him speak, and they keep shouting at him. No, no, we can't have it. It's, it, it's not, it, it hurts our democracy if you shut down anyone, okay? Now, if you want to pursue, you know, the politically uh, an avenue in which to charge Karl Rowe with some crimes, whether it's FISA, whether, wh whatever else it might be, that's a different ball game, and that's, everybody's got their rights. But I think doing it in this way not only is not the right thing to do, but it doesn't help your cause. Because what you're doing is you're creating sympathy for Rove. You don't want to do that. Everybody, uh, look, not everybody, but 90% of the people that look at that thing, oh, why won't they leave poor Carl Rove alone? You don't want to do that. And you don't want to seem like the teabag guys. That's terrible. So, look, bounds of reason, okay? I'm not saying don't have the protest. Definitely have the protest. But keep it civil enough that both sides can engage in a conversation. 
Otherwise, you know, everything breaks down, and and we lose what's great about this country. Okay, so now having said that, let's let's hit some of those, uh, you know, pro, you know, I guess you could call them process stories, but I think they're so in, enormously important to how our political system runs. So first, there's a guy named Peter Roberson, and he's a staffer um, that worked on financial reform in the House. Now, you say, well, nobody's heard of him. He's not a congressman. He's not a senator. Why is Peter Roberson so important? Well, he's one of the guys that actually, as the staffer, writes the legislation. Now, among the Financial Services Committee in the House that wrote financial reform for the House, 16 of those, including 12 Democrats, were former lobbyists in the industry. Now, already you say, well, look, if they're former lobbyists, certainly they had some inclination in that direction. They have some sympathy for the industry, likely. It doesn't mean they should be disqualified from working in the committee, but you've got to be a little bit careful because you, you don't want to introduce that bias, obviously, because they're the ones that are regulating that industry. So Roberson himself uh, was, in fact, between 2000 and 2006, before he went back into Congress, um, lobbied for the Bond Market Association. They then went on to merge and become uh, the securities industry uh, and Financial Markets Association, that's a huge uh, lobbying group for the financial industry. In fact, another staffer was also, a form, another former committee staffer, now works for that. Uh, his name is Michael Pace. So there's a lot of going in and out of the industry. Now, why are we talking about Roberson today? Because he just left and joined Intercontinental, Intercontinental Exchange Incorporated. Who are they? They are the largest lobbying firm for, that handles the issue of credit default swaps for banks. What part of the legislation did Paul Roberson write? The one that affects credit default swaps for banks. Now, when Frank found out about this, Barney Frank, who's the head of the committee, said instantly told Roberson, that's it, you're out. You're not allowed to have any more contact with the committee. Uh, when he said he was having uh, interviewing with this group, right? And, and he was, according to the reporters, was fairly mad about that, especially because, as I told you, another staffer went and worked for the other lobbyist group. But think about, uh, I said Paul earlier, I meant Peter. Peter Roberson has an enormous incentive to write weak legislation. If he knows right afterwards, he's going to get paid by the guys who want weak legislation and weak reform. We've got to stop this. This is madness. Because, and as analysts look at the House bill now, they're like, hey, you know what? The absolute weakest part of that financial reform package in the House is what they do in regards to credit default swaps. Why? The guy who worked as a lobbyist before for that industry and who now again works as a lobbyist in that industry is the one who wrote the legislation or had an integral part in writing it. If we continue in this way, all of our legislation will be written by the guys we're supposed to be regulated. And of course it won't work. Of course it'll be weak. Of course it'll be ineffectual. And of course we'll have another crash. And when we have that crash, you'll have more staffers on the Hill writing legislation that worked as lobbyists before, that know they're going to work as lobbyists afterwards, and that have all the incentive in the world to take more of your taxpayer money and give it to those guys that pay them. So now, one of the reasons that they got away with this is because Roberson says, all right, well, no, I won't lobby the House afterwards then. For a year, uh, there's a ban on that. Um, I'll just lobby Senate, and I'll lobby the uh, White House. Now, remember, we told you earlier about a story of a guy named Damon Munches, who was the leading liaison for the Treasury Department in financial reform in dealing with Congress. He left to work for a company that makes money on, on the, making sure you have weak financial reform and figuring out what exactly is going to be in the financial reform. So tremendous financial incentive there. And Munches's trick was, well, okay, I won't lobby the White House. I'll just lobby the Senate and the House. You see how this game is played? And, but even for Munches and for Roberson, the, what the lobbyists are buying more than their expertise or their ability to lobby in the future, the thing that they're really buying is their allegiance while they're still inside our government. The, the Munchesses of the world, the Roberson of the world, know as they're working the Treasury Department in the Hill writing the weak legislation that they're going to get hired by these guys and get a great payday, 
if they play ball. If they don't play ball, they don't get the big payday. And that's how our government officials get these implicit bribes. And that's why we have the weak reform that we have now. We've got to change the system. It's owned by the people we're supposed to be regulating. All right, so that's the story of Roberson and why uh, we won't have effective reform in credit default swaps. By the way, the House version is weak. He wrote it. The Senate version is even weaker. The guys who wrote that, where are they going next? Right? The, uh, the White House version isn't very strong itself, especially on credit default swaps, and we know where that guy went. And by the way, credit default swaps, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but in my opinion, and I've said this for over a year now, is the most important thing to regulate. Because <laughs> that's the one where they're taking all the risk and they're playing with enormous dollars. The, that market is worth $300 trillion. That's five times larger than the entire world economy. That's what's going to blow, and that's the weakest part, because they effectively bought the regulators. And not, in this case, not the regulators, but the guys writing the regulation. That's exactly the kind of government capture that Simon Johnson talks about all the time. We're in a lot of trouble because of exactly that type of thing. All right, now, second story that I think is uh, critical to how our system works. So there's all these groups and papers out there denying uh, global warming. Well, where are they coming from? Well, Greenpeace, who of course cares about this issue deeply, wanted to do some research into this, uh, and they wanted to see where the money was coming from and who's backing this. And, and, and they've uh, looked into it, and they traced the money, which is a lot of it is in the public record. Some of it is not. So what, here's what they found out from the public record. Uh, the number one people behind all of the groups, the, and they fund 40 different organizations uh, that are d deny global warming. The main group is called Koch Industries, K-O-C-H. Now, Koch Industries is a fascinating thing. It was actually started by a guy named Fred Koch. <laughs> you know one of the ways that he got rich. Uh, he built oil refineries, refineries in the Soviet Union when Joseph Stalin was in charge. Then he came into the U.S., and he was one of the co-founders of the John Birch Society, which is extreme right-wing. <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to talk about socialist, communist, Stalinist, and right-wing, fascist, etc., it's all wrapped in one here. And I'm not saying that Fred Koch was a fascist, and I don't want to make Glenn Beck-like comments, but there is some great irony in how this company got built by doing business with Stalin, and then starting the John Birch Society. But now let's get to today, which is a lot more relevant. Uh, his sons uh, now run the company, and it's a privately held company, second largest privately held company in the country. Uh, Charles Koch and David Koch, they're worth about 14 and $16 billion apiece. They're among the richest people in the whole world. Uh, I believe they're in the top 20 uh, in, in the world, and, and the uh, 19th richest person in the world is one of them, and they're both in the top 10 in America. So richer than the Google founders, uh, richer than George Soros, et cetera. So what do they do with their money? Well, they, they spend it uh, on right-wing organizations for a number of reasons. Why? First, they want to deny global warming. Why? Because their main business is oil refineries. So if you've got oil refineries, well, you're not interested in the green movement. That costs you money. That doesn't make you money. So what do they do? They invest, in, the, in their case, since 1997, 48 million dollars into these groups. Now think about that. For them, they run this giant corporation, it's one of the biggest in the country. Forty-eight and a half million dollars is almost nothing. And that, the fluctuation in oil prices alone, which affects their business, on any given year would easily make up that forty-eight and a half million dollars. But in the world of politics, that's a gigantic amount of money. So, like I said, it funds 40 different organizations. And what do they do? Well, one of the things that they do is they go out there and they are think tanks, and they put out papers, and uh, they do lobbying, and they organize grassroots efforts. One of the uh, organizations they find, fund is Americans for Prosperity. Those are the guys that organize the Tea Party protests. So they got $5 million from Coke Industries. Okay? So... Some of that goes to that. So Tea Party guys think, oh, yeah, we're doing this for us. No, you're not. You're doing it for Coke Industries. 
<laughs> You're doing it for different reasons. Now, in health care reform, they're against health care reform. Apparently, they think that's going to hurt their bottom line in some way. And for them, for that particular company, or for those particular owners of the company, maybe they're right. Okay? But they're certainly not representing the people of the United States or those Tea Party protesters, nor do they give a damn about them. Now, but that's small apples for them. Real business is in uh, climate change denial and in taxes. So in climate change denial, and that's what Greenpeace focuses on, um, one of the things they do is they fund non-scientifically, non-peer-reviewed scientific studies, which are in fact non-scientific studies. But they put science in the title. So for example, one of the ones that they funded was a study on how polar bears' uh, populations are not suffering in the Arctic because of global warming. Now, when that was reviewed by other scientists, it's flat out not true. Right? They, they hired a bunch of people, they paid them a lot of money to write this honestly crap. And, but it didn't matter, they don't care. So even after the other scientists said, look, this is proven fact, the, the population is going down, you can't write this or you can't put this out, after they knew that, they put out the paper anyway. Why? Because they just want to sow some doubt. They want to say, well, some scientists say this and other scientists say that, so let's delay, let's not do anything, let's keep relying on oil because that makes them a tremendous amount of money. And this is how we get the disinformation we have out there. Another huge issue for Coke Industries is taxes. Forty-eight and a half million dollars. I mean, they easily save that on the lower taxes that the Republicans and the conservatives fight for. They say, oh, lower taxes for the American people, but that's not reality. For example, Obama had cut taxes for people making under $250,000. But he had to, in order to try to balance the budget in some way, raise taxes from people making above $250,000. And for a guy making $300,000, that, that affects him a little bit because, it, remember, it's marginal tax rate. So between two fifty and $300,000, it gets a slightly higher uh, tax rate, right? But for a guy that has $14 or $16 billion, that extra couple of extra percentage points is hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases. So. For them, of course, they have all the incentive in the world to organize these protests, to do the think tanks, to do the ads, to do all of that effort, to say, no, 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 we have to have lower taxes, lower taxes, not for the regular Americans, but for everybody, including the richest Americans, namely the Koch family. And this is how they buy, you know, what they would call facts on their side. They buy a report, they, and they, they go to the media, and they say, oh, well, here's a scientist's report. They buy protests, they organize them, and they get people like Dick Army, et cetera, to lead that group to say, all right, now go, go, fight against government regulation, fight for lower taxes. So as all these conservatives think that they're fighting for themselves, they're not. They got funded to fight against their own interests by the people running Coke Industries. So they're, they're running an enormous scam on you. And if you're confused as to which party did they favor, in the 2008 elections, uh, Coke Industries uh, gave 88% to the Republican Party okay, of their givings. Now the rest, I can assure you, went to the corporate Democrats, the blue dog Democrats, etc. And, and I'm, I, I love that uh, Greenpeace did this little study uh, to give you a, a sense of not just how this system works, but exactly where the money goes and exactly who spends the most amount of money. To give you a sense of perspective, since uh, 2005, between 05 and 08, the Coke industry spent $25 million on these kind of political movements. Exxon only spent $8.9 million. Okay. And if you look at the groups that are fighting global warming and denying it, all those right-wing think tanks, etc., they're all funded by only three groups, Coke Industries, Exxon Mobil, and the Petroleum Lobbyist Group, which is a combination of all of the different oil companies uh, represented by that lobbyist group. You think they care about actual science? You think they care if the planet is warming or not? No, they care about making an extra buck. Even if you're a conservative, that's got to be patently obvious to you. Can't you see the game they're playing? So don't believe the hype. If they're a real scientists, not funded by these guys, and they, so, and they have real doubts about global warming, I, of course I want to listen to them. Uh, we have, all I care about is the facts. I, I don't have a horse in that race. I don't need global warming to be real. But that's what every non-bought scientist says. You've got to look at their motivations. 
and you got to see why they're riling you up. You know, and, and I hope, look, don't trust us, don't trust Greenpeace. If you're a conservative out there or a libertarian, do your own research. Look at it. See if they're right or if they're wrong. See who's brought you to that, who paid for the bus that brought you to that protest. Who made the signs as you uh, got off the bus and handed it to you? Who gave you the donuts at that rally? We've covered that before. Who's funding all this so-called global warming denying science? And when you see who it is and you see how much money they have to make from it and how much money they invested into it, can't you see that you should at least say, well, they've got a little bit of a bias here. Of course they do. And they're trying to make a buck off of your passion and redirecting it in the wrong way. Please look into it. All right, when we come back, uh, Richard Stengler, the editor of Time Magazine, to talk to us about Nelson Mandela, Young Turks. Back on the Young Turks. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, of course, and we're gonna to talk to uh, Richard Stengel now. He's the editor of Time Magazine. He's also a bit of an expert, to say the least, on uh, Nelson Mandela. He wrote his, uh, Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom, uh, or helped him write in 93. He's co-producer in 1996 of the Oscar-nominated documentary Mandela, and he's got a new book out now, Mandela's Way, 15 Lessons on Life, Love, and Courage. Uh, with a preface from Nelson Mandela, which makes sense. Richard, welcome to the Young Turks. Great to be on with you. All right, great to have you here. Now, uh, Nelson Mandela is, uh, in my opinion, a living legend, and the one guy that I look up to most in the world. Um, but not everybody shares my opinion. Uh, lately, I don't know if you've noticed this, there's some uh, right-wing revisionist history going around. I've heard Rush Limbaugh say it and some others saying, what are you talking about? Mandela's a terrorist. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's tackle that first. Let's get that out of the way. Um, he was the leader of the, uh, the military wing of the African National Congress. So tell me a little bit about that, and tell me why the right wing is wrong about that analysis. Well, I mean, the, it's, it's an interesting question, Jake, because um, let's, let's look at the history, right? I mean, the, if we go back you know, to the 40s and 50s, I mean, South Africa, the Nationalist Party came to power in 1948, and they had a, you know, a racist philosophy called apartheid that had a different legal system for white and black and yet uh... that country was an ally of of the u.s. and great britain and other western countries and so you know nelson mandela was the leader of a revolutionary movement that wanted to topple that um, that government and he was considered a terrorist by by the u.s. and by great britain and and certainly within within south africa so i mean in that sense that's true just the same way that you know that uh... That, that George Washington was considered a terrorist by, by Great Britain, and Thomas Jefferson and, and the great leaders of the, of the Republic in the early days during the Revolutionary War. So, you know, that leads to a couple of other interesting questions. Does that mean that uh, perhaps we should be a little bit more open to negotiation with anyone uh, at this point? Because it's easy to say, all right, you know what, Hamas, they're terrorists. But maybe there's a Nelson Mandela floating around somewhere in there. Well, look, everybody, you know, as you point out, I mean, in a way, everybody is looking for a Nelson Mandela. I mean, I, you know, I still see stories, you know, who's the Nelson Mandela of Afghanistan? Who's the Nelson Mandela of Iraq? And, and I mean, part of what I think makes sense about that is that he was also a person who was willing to see the good in others and to see the other side and to make a, a find a rapprochement with his enemy. I mean, that, that's, that was the lesson of Nelson Mandela when he came out of prison. But that man who went into prison, as you say, was the leader of the, of the military wing of the ANC, the first kind of commander of the military wing of the ANC. And, and basically he said, and, and, and in our conversations, he would often say, you know, he had one great goal, which was to, was to make South Africa a, a non-racial democracy, one man, one person, one vote. And, and pretty much anything else that would, anything that would get you there was a tactic. And, and so he looked at whether the ANC should be nonviolent or violent in a strategic way, not necessarily in a moral way. And, and, and I, I think for so much reconciliation to happen in the world today, people have to be, they have to be practical. They can't be ideological. See, then that leads us, I think, to the most interesting question. When did he judge that going the military route was not the best strategy and switch over to the diplomatic route, and why did he come to that decision? Well, you know, that really only happened, frankly, after he came out of prison. I mean, uh, P.W. Bota, who was then the state president, um, you know, 
probably four or five years before Mandela was ultimately released, made an offer to release him if he would unconditionally renounce violence and 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 the military struggle, and and he refused to do so. And so, you know, there were there were opportunities to do that, but he felt that he could only do that from a position of strength and not weakness. And 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 really, that only happened, you know, when when there really was a kind of new constitution and a date set for for a democratic election and and what he was afraid of was was not the military wing of the ANC he was afraid of the of a of a very very extreme right wing uh you know uh white afrikaner uh military movement in south africa that would that would cause a civil war so when he how did he gain that position of power where then he could turn around and go okay let's not do anything military let's go the nonviolent route you know that happened when you know he had never been he was not the leader of the ANC when he went into prison and 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 one of the things that happened during all those years in prison apart from it teaching him self discipline and self control which became the hallmark of his leadership it also made him an icon around the world and and you know the free mandela movement started you know um you know, 20 years or 10, 15 years before he was released. So, so when he came out of prison, he was the 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 de facto leader of the of uh, of the ANC and 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 the movement for democracy in South Africa. And he had to rise to the occasion. I mean, that was the you know it wasn't it you know power was thrust upon him. He didn't actually necessarily seek it, and and it it gave him great power. And the fact that he used that power. Wisely and generously, and sought, you know, to, and told everybody, let's, you know, we need to forget the past and forgive our enemies. Was was the thing that brought, I think, harmony eventually to South Africa. And I think uh, certainly part of what made him a living legend, in my mind, uh, it is that when you he could have gone in another direction. I mean, it's one of those pivotal moments, kind of like when after the American Revolution they say to George Washington, right, "Great job. Now, would you like to be king?" And he's right. Like, no, that, no, that was that's not the point of this whole thing. No, in fact, that's a, I think that's a great analogy because I think Washington is a is a is a comparable figure to compare Mandela to because, as you say, you know, lots of people wanted Washington to be king or president for life. There were no term limits in those days. He decided after his second term that he would that he would retire, and and in fact, Mandela, uh, you know, decided after his first term that he would retire. That you know that really hadn't happened in in African countries or democracies almost ever before so just the way washington said every every step i take in the sand is is some is 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 going to be seen and followed by somebody that's the same thing as as, as nelson mandela saw we're talking to richard Stengel. he's the editor of time magazine and wrote the new book mandela's way it, one last question on that route richard which is you know I, I didn't mean to come to hamas so often but as we're having this conversation you think you know look mandela didn't renounce violence until he was in a position where he thought he could um, so, you know, I, I don't, I've always rejected Hamas's route towards violence, but when you look at the analogy, does it hold to say that, well, okay, I, I get strategically why they're not uh, recognizing Israel uh, for the moment being. Does that, does that make sense? Well, look, if we look at history, I mean, look at all of the, of the, of the revolutionary and, and even violent movements that then became politically accepted, you know, from, from what happened in, you know, the, the Revolutionary War in this country, to uh, the IRA, to the uh, you know the PLO, um, you know they were all once branded as terrorist institutions that you couldn't negotiate with or, or bargain with, and and in the case of Hamas, I mean I think even you know um, you know even the the Obama government, I mean there are people in the government who think that we need to talk to Hamas, that you know that it's better to try to find something that we have in common with them than to ostracize them and ostracizing them you know may give them power so i mean i think there's a historical precedent for all of this and um, you know and it's not you know very far away either all right now let, let's talk about the book because this is not his autobiography this is the fifteen lessons on life love and, and courage as you say in the title and there's some very interesting lessons uh, here uh, it, it, you have different chapters on lead from the front and lead from the back how do you do both? What does that mean? Well, he's a man of complexity. I mean, he can he can contain contradictions. And leading from the front is something that we all understand. That's you know, standing up, jumping out of the trench, and saying, "Follow me." But but leading from the back is in some ways more interesting. And it, I, I remember we were we used to take these 
very early morning walks. He's a very early riser, and we would meet at 5 a.m. To, to take a walk, and we were doing this once near where he grew up in the Transkei of South Africa, and he asked me, um, you know, have you ever herded cattle? And I'm, I'm a city kid, and I, you know, had to answer no, and he and I asked him why, and he said, well, it's an interesting lesson for leadership because the way you herd cattle is you do it from, from the back. You do it from behind. You, you get them to go in the direction you want, not, not by leading from the front, but by finding some, you know, some, some others to deputize as your leaders to, kind of to, to, to push and guide from the rear. And that is one of the things that he realized about leadership, too, that, that you can't you know, you can't hog all the glory. You can't always be the person, you know, seen to be leading from the front. And, and I think that's one of the lessons that he learned in prison, and it's one of the things that I think helped him once he came out, because he, he empowered a lot of people to lead alongside of him. Richard, there's a chapter in your book, uh, chapter 13, uh, that Sarah Palin's going to love. Uh, it's quitting is leading, too. Uh, how so? How should Sarah Palin be encouraged that sometimes quitting is also leading? Well, because he, you know, he would say that I think one of the weaknesses of so many leaders is that they, they, they can't change their mind. That they, that it looks like weakness to to change your opinion about something. And 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 what I meant by that, and I think what he means by that is is this idea that he says that you know when circumstances change, you change your mind. It's not it's not a weakness to change your mind. It's actually a strength. And so, um, so I, I think what he means and what I mean by quitting is leading too is that is that in fact you know sometimes you have to say you know what I, I've I've uh, you know I've gone down the wrong path or I, I can't achieve this end I have to try something different you know it, it, Dave are you listening to this okay our executive producer Dave always gives me grief for changing my mind I used to be a Republican now I'm certainly not uh, and because things change context matters and what I get out of the book a lot is the balance matters too because there's also a chapter called uh, Have a Core Principle. So tell me a little bit about that, and w when do you stick to the core principle, and when do you say, all right, look, uh, we got to make compromise here, or I was wrong about something? Right. I mean, in his case, I mean, the core principle was achieving a, a democratic South Africa with one person, one vote, and, you know, allowing majority rule, which had never existed there before. I think t that was his core principle. Everything else was a tactic or a strategy. And so I think he would say that, you know, no, I'm not going to renounce that core principle, but, but basically almost anything else was something that you could compromise about or something that you could see the other side. And, and that, I think, was one of his great strengths, is that he, he wasn't ideological. He was very pragmatic, and, um, and he would find a way to, to get to that ultimate end that some people might regard as, as compromising or giving up. You know, I often question myself on how I'm seeing Obama uh, as his presidency unfolds, and I think he makes too many compromises. But then, you know, I saw, and it's goofy, but I saw Invictus about, you know, and of course that's about Nelson Mandela and, and the rugby team. And, and I hear you talking, and I read the book, and it seems like, God, you know, Mandela did so many compromises, and I wonder if I'm seeing Obama wrong or in that sense, that... that you know, would I be surprised, would I be shocked at how many compromises Mandela did as long as he kept that one core principle? You know, I think you might be. And there were certainly people within the ANC and, and within his movement that thought he um, had capitulated, that he, you know, that he had given in, that he was compromising with the enemy. And that happened, you know, d different times in his, in his career. And it happened while he was in prison when he secretly started negotiations with the government. I mean, there were people who thought that, that he was a traitor, um, a traitor to their movement. And, you know, he would say, and I think he was proved right, that, you know, this was the right thing to do and, and, and that we can't, you know, overthrow the government with armed struggle. We always have to have, have a discussion. We always have to have a negotiation. So why not start now? And, you know, another one of his lessons is, is play the long game, is that you, you know, you have to, you have to, particularly in politics, I mean, you have to look, try to look over the horizon. And, and I don't know, you might say about, you know, the health care bill that maybe, maybe Obama didn't handle it perfectly in every way, but he was sort of playing a long game. And, and, um, and he ultimately got pretty much to the place that he wanted. I mean, that would be the, the Mandela way of looking at it. 
Right. You know, and I don't want to, Obama's overhyped enough, and I don't want to compare him too much to Mandela. Uh, but there is one other final chapter here that I want to talk about that, again, r reminds me of, of Obama. Keep your rivals close. As, as I'm reading that, I'm thinking Hillary Clinton at the State Department. But, but t tell us uh, what that means and the difference between friends, enemies, and rivals. Um, it's a good question. I mean, the, uh, he, he would say, I mean, of course, there's that um, line from The Godfather, right? Keep your, keep your friends close, but your enemies even closer. And, and that's a, just a very pragmatic thing of, you know, watch, you know, watch closely so you don't get stabbed in the back. But, but I, I think he would say that, and he, has, and he certainly has that practical side of it, um, but in his first government, I mean, he brought all of his rivals in, from, from F.W. de Klerk to Gotcha Budalese, and and basically it's the idea that you know you can you can probably find something that you can both compromise on that, that you can find something that that unites you more than divides you and that gets you closer to your end goal than than ostracizing the person and i think also he realized that it's it makes you look bigger like if you have a if you have a big tent and it makes you look more generous and he was always concerned with how things appeared and how his leadership appeared, and I think that that, that factored in also. All right, we're talking to Richard Stengel. He's uh, the editor of Time Magazine, and the book is Mandela's Way. Richard, before we let you go, I wanted to ask you a couple of quick questions on Time Magazine, too, uh, so we have you on the show. Sure. You know, I was just at the Guardian uh, Changing Media Summit. There was a lot of um, talk about the, uh, the state of the industry. Michael Wolff uh, did a little uh, speech where he said all the newspapers are going to be gone in 12 months. That might be a bit much, but I don't think he's that far off. How much trouble are magazines in uh, as opposed to the newspapers? Are they in better shape, and, and how does that reflect on time? Well, I, you know, we're in pretty good shape, and I think magazines in general are, are certainly in better shape than newspapers. I mean, the you know, it's funny, there's probably, you know, it's an inverse ratio. The more often you publish, the worse shape you're in, because if you're publishing every day like newspapers, then you're, you're really competing with the web, and so it's hard to justify that print product. But, but I guess, you know, I, you know the, and, and Michael is a friend of mine and, and an incredibly smart guy. I mean, the, I mean, I think what he meant is, that, you know, that there, are, that, that there are plenty of newspapers that will go away in their physical print form, but, I mean, you know, where do we go online on the web to get our news and information from newspapers, from magazines, from news sites? And, and you know, the, the desire for news and information, I think, has been high, is higher now than almost any time ever. And, and you know, traditionally newspapers and, and magazines are the, are the most reputable and trustworthy places to go. I mean, that's one of the things that, I, that keeps time so strong is that people, people trust us to separate the, the wheat from the chaff, to convert information into knowledge and and I think there's always going to be a place for that and I think too that all of these different forms even the physical forms of, of publications will still exist I mean the scales will change you know uh, you know the the uh, Apple iPad is coming out next week um, you know I think that will will start to change the industry too but I think I think all the different forms will continue to exist simultaneously the the relative scales and the ratio may change but but i mean you know physical newspapers and physical magazines and physical publications are are not going away uh, do you sense there's going to be a shift over to uh, chart like i don't know why they don't do this it seems like the right model why don't they charge per article instead of saying hey you got to subscribe to time magazine and pay x amount of money per month or whatever uh, if you see an article online, charge a nickel for it, wh whatever it is to read it. Is that is that happening at all in the industry? Well, it's, a lot of people are talking about it, and 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 I and there are some places that do it. I mean, the you know, for a long time, the technology that was kind of a difficult technology. You know, people called it the you know micro charges, and you know, how do you charge somebody five cents for an article, and they have to register and all of that. But I think people are gradually getting used to that, and you're looking at a lot of big. Media companies, you know, like News Corp, um, you know, which is owned by Rupert Murdoch, and and the New York Times Company, and Time Inc., my my corporate parent, talking about charging for content, and um, I think that's something you'll also see in 12 months is that you'll you'll see a lot less, uh, of, you know, free um, journalism on the web in 12 months than you do right now.
All right. Richard Stengel, editor of Time Magazine, and the book is Mandela's Way, 15 Lessons on Life, Love, and Courage. Very interesting read. Uh, I mean, I love Nelson Mandela, so I found it very, very interesting, but I think all of you will, too. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Richard. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you so much, Jane. All right. We'll be right back.